So, uh, before we go to the lunch, uh, we have one more speaker. It's uh, Nicholas Wittenborn from uh, Point9 Capital, and he's going to talk about SAS metrics and the bad practices in it. I'm really looking forward to talk as a SAS uh, guy myself. Thank you. Oh. I, I think I have a mic. So, hello, everybody. Um, this is going to be a bit more practical than, than what we had now. Um, it's we're I'm talking about the nine worst practices in SaaS metrics. Now, you might have noticed that this says Christoph Jans, and I, I'm not him. Um, so, today, uh, I will guide you through these slides. The reason is that he's on a plane to Silicon Valley at the moment. Um, so, if I'm not Christoph Jans, who am I? I'm uh, Nicholas. I work with Point9 Capital, which is a, a VC based out of Berlin. And um, I do blog a little bit and tweet as well at NCSH. And if I have to sum up our investment thesis very quickly, it's uh, we love SaaS. So I um, counted our current uh, fund investments, and pretty much exactly two thirds are in software as a service companies. And uh, you can uh, see a selection of the active portfolio down there. Maybe you know a couple of these companies. And um, of course, besides this, we also have uh, uh, great investments from the partners that founded Point9. Um, before the time of Point9, like Zendesk, who just won um, the country for the sexiest enterprise startup and uh, beat out competition like uh, Box or New Relic. So before I go into this, uh, one more announcement. Uh, if you've been here this morning, you heard it already. But uh, we actually did our first investment in the Baltics um, and announced it this morning. It's Infogram. Wow. All this, uh, <laughs> thank you. And Yeah, uh, that was a co-investment with a UK company, Connect Ventures. We're very happy to, to be on board and uh, excited for what uh, the future holds for Infogram. So let's get into the meat. We were talking about uh, the nightmares of, of SaaS metrics. And uh, one point, so just uh, in case you're not running a SaaS company, it still might be very relevant for you because a lot of these points are quite general um, about startup metrics. So uh, we're talking about the equivalent of this, that, or this in SaaS metrics, right? So what's the first? The first is to confuse MRR with cash inflow, or bookings, or revenues, or whatever else metrics. The only thing that really counts is monthly recurring revenues. What is that? That is the revenue that you will uh, keep on having in the next month if there's no new additions or no churn of your current accounts, right? And this is actually really the, the number one uh, metric that you should know. So if you're not tracking anything else, Start with this. It's a, it's a very good start. Um, we have a quick example here just to, to um, show you what we mean. So in general, it, the very simple um, rule of thumb is to break everything down for a monthly basis, right? So if you have two customers, one is on a, a $20 monthly plan and the other is on a $120 yearly plan, you divide it all by 12, the yearly plans, add it to the monthly plan, and you get an MRR of uh, $30. Now, wha now, why do you want to do that? Um, I added comments in red here um, to Christoph's slides to make it a bit more explicit. It's uh, A, you have predictable revenues, right? This will help you a lot with uh, budgeting and financial planning, and you have this stable source of income that, that you know where you will be at um, approximately in the next couple of months or in the next couple of years. Um, it's Second of all, it's a very uh, big component of determining the lifetime value of your company. Uh, so. Uh, Lifetime, uh, sorry, lifetime value of your users. So um, at the time that you know how long your users stay with your company, you can start to do calculations like how much can I spend on acquisition of these customers. And lastly, um, for investors, uh, it's become kind of a, a um, valuation basis. Like there's no hard rule on that, but you've seen um, a lot of um, valuation, especially for later stage companies, being based on MRR. So know your MRR. Next, underestimating churn. Um, Doing this, how? I mean, everybody underestimates the churn when they plan, I think. Um, so reality is uh, more fierce than you would imagine in most cases. But the case that we're talking about here is to mix um, annual plans with monthly plans. The reason is that if you include the annual plans into, into your churn denominator down here, this number will increase, right? But these are people that, on a monthly basis, don't even have the choice to churn, right? So you should only look at the people that are really ending their contract or could possibly cancel their contract, right? So um, this is the correct formula and not how we see it often, just the uh, number of people that churned divided by the total number of paying customers. That's wrong. And actually, I just did an analysis on this at uh, the beginning of this week. 
um, and the change was really dramatic. So it was like uh, almost a three times increase if you filtered out all the annual plans. So it can be a very, very uh, big impact on your customer lifetime calculations. And uh, as a small side comment here, you should also not forget to include churn in your financial plans. Some companies do it already. Most of them underestimate um, the, the amount of terms that it will see. Just use a benchmark from a competitor that has a similar product if you don't have any actual data yet. But don't forget to include it because it's going to influence the growth that you will experience in the next year a lot. Next, ignore your cohorts. So for us personally, as, as point nine, this is the cohorts are the only way that you can really understand retention and the customer lifetime. So we do it for every SaaS investment that we look at. We also do it for most of the other investments uh, in other areas, if it makes sense. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but um, this is Mixpanel. It's a great tool to, to use that. You don't need Mixpanel. You can do it by yourself uh, in a Google spreadsheet, but this is a good, good tool to use that. And um, just quickly, what do you see here? So on the left side, you have um, the, the name of the cohort. So it's all people or all, all paid signups in the month of November or December and so on. This is a weekly analysis. You have the base and you see on the horizontal line, you see the retention over the user's lifetime, right? So this tells you when is how, much, how big is the drop-off in the first month, in the second, in the third. And this is crucial, again, because um, after you have collected enough data, let's say six months, ideally 12 months, you can start to, to really uh, grasp how many of your users are still active there, extrapolate it, and get to your um, lifetime of the users, and combined with MRR, the lifetime value. Now, vertically, we can see that um, there the, the, the delta, so to say, of the retention over the product lifetime, right? So ideally, what you want to see is an improvement going down because your product is getting more mature, you're adding more features, you're working more on um, keeping users happy. So that's what we're looking for as well, that the company keeps on evolving, it's doing better and better, and it's taking care of um, binding the customers. Uh, the next step, don't track each step of the conversion funnel. So we have a, yeah, the, no matter what, you, what, you, what kind of uh, analysis you use, whether you use IDA, which is, uh, attention, interest, desire, and action, or you go with McClure, who does this R private thing uh, that actually takes um, a couple of additional steps into the equation like uh, retention afterwards, referral re rate, and revenues that you produce over the lifetime. It's important that you go over every step of the conversion funnel because there's most likely optimization uh, potential in every one of these steps. So a lot of companies that we talk to, they know their conversions from free to paid or from, from trial to paid, but they don't have a, a really good grasp on the whole so life cycle and sign up cycle. So do that to improve it. Uh, number five, mix up visitors to your marketing website with users of your software. We have a practical uh, example for that here. So. The blue line gives you um, the amount of traffic that your website or marketing website receives over time. As for example, covering TechCrunch, more marketing, whatever. A lot of more people go to your marketing websites. However, the signups remain pretty stable, right? That results in us thinking that the signup rate is decreasing. But now, if we look, if this is when you check the marketing website, but if we look at actual uh, visitors or users or in the sign-up process that get to, to, to the point of like signing up and converting it to, to users, the picture might look very differently, right? So you can see that although the marketing side traffic is increasing, people are actually not clicking on and not really signing up with the service, so um, it stays flat, the sign-up rate is still flat, and it gives you a pretty actionable insight into where you have to work in the conversion funnel. Next, this is actually a very relevant point to all startups. Um, show customer acquisition costs on a blended basis only. What does that mean? That means you take all the, the free um, signups that you receive and mix it with the ones that you pay for and divide the whole marketing budget by all the people that sign up. Why is this um, not accurate? We can see that this is a very simple example here. So if you have 100 customers that come organically to your service, and then you have 20 customers that fa uh, come through some kind of acquisition channel and you pay $500 for them, then on average you would pay $83 for, for a customer, right? But do $83 buy you a customer? No, you, you can't, that's not an actionable insight, right? So this doesn't help you at all. What's important is to look at the, the customer acquisition cost through every specific channel so you know where to put the money and where, to, where you can scale it further. That's not to say that um, you shouldn't be fighting for all free signups that you can get. Of course, uh, that's the best source, and even in the, uh, especially in the beginning, 
this is going to be probably your major source of, of, of traffic coming in. So do catch these low-hanging fruits, but don't expect them to scale unlimitedly because you will reach a part, hopefully you will reach a, part, uh, a stage with your company where um, these sources are um, limited or you reach a ceiling for these sources. And then you will have to spend money to acqu acquire new customers. And the earlier you know how much you spend for them, the better. Num that's the uh, top three coming up now. So the first is attribute all conversions to your sales team. So at one point in your uh, company, f if you have a SaaS business, you will probably hire inside salesperson, maybe direct if you have uh, big contract values. Uh, be aware of this. I don't know if you, you, you've uh, seen these before, but this is actually in theme parks, um, little cars for children that they sit in and they think they steer the car, right? But it's actually on tracks, so they're not doing anything, but they think they're steering it. So important for when you hire salespeople and get them, in a, uh, get them um, to, to push your sales is to really see if they have an impact, right? So have a control group, look at signups that don't come through the sales leads, but just uh, sign up by themselves or through another source and then see whether the ones that are touched from the sales personnel really make a difference because they might just, you might just have an awesome product, right? So do test this and see if there's really a conversion uplift before you hand out really big bonuses. And Vice versa, also be aware that if you do this and you fire the third salesperson because uh, he couldn't have like produce an uplift in, in uh, conversions, then maybe this is not the, the reason for it, right? Maybe it's not the salesperson. Check with your product, value proposition. It could also be um, another source of fault. So number two, um, assume that you're growing exponentially. This is um, something that we, we see quite often and it's um, pretty ironic because um, what you see is all there is. So um, startups that have been growing like 15%, 20% month over month for the first four months in their lifetime think they're going to continue growing like this for the next 24 months. But in reality, this is not happening. It's really hard for SaaS startups especially to achieve viral growth. Why? Because there's no social component. The network effects are quite limited. So in truth, it's pretty much a, a solid, solid growth and you have to be very persistent to, to get to, um, to levels that are similar to, to exponential growth. And um, don't overestimate this when you do the planning and when you do the financial models. Um, if you're interested in this, there's a very good talk by uh, Gail Goodman, which is called uh, The Long Slow SaaS Ramp of Death, very fitting. Uh, you can watch that on YouTube and it gives you a very good, um, very good background on this from the point of view of a CEO of a very um, successful SaaS company, Constant Contact. So the last one, that's uh, pretty important for us or because we struggle with this um, often, but on the other hand, it's also important for the startups. It's just not so easy to make them see that. It's um, don't just start tracking KPIs once you are looking out for investor money. For sure, you have other things to do in the beginning. You have to build a team, you have to build a product, you have to get it out, you have to it iterate on customer develop, uh, you do customer interviews and, and keep on developing the products. However, still, as soon as you get into a, a stage where you have usage, track it because you don't want to look like this, right? So to know how to improve your metrics, you have to know where you stand with them. And if you start doing this too late, then you will start optimizing too late. And if we come in and have to go through all this data, um, it's going to be super difficult and take a lot of time from away from the deal process that otherwise could have been used differently. So that's the other point is if you s only do it when the investor asks for it, you're going to have to go back, collect all this data, work on it, compile it, and it's going to be super headache as opposed to just tracking it from, from the beginning. So that's it. Uh, these were the nine tips. It's a lot of information. Maybe uh, I was a bit fast with that, <laughs> but uh, I can put that up on, on SlideShare. You can, um, uh, of course, reach out to us anytime. If you have any questions, just shoot them mail to Christoph. If they're hard, if they're easy, you can also send them to me <laughs> or just ask me afterwards. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. So we have perhaps time for two questions because I know everyone can smell lunch coming off the balcony. So let's have two questions and then you'll have to uh, find Nicholas afterwards. Two questions. First one. Anyone want to go for it or is everyone really hungry? <laughs> Going? Going? You can also find me afterwards and ask in person. Uh, it looks like everyone's hungry. So I have, I have a couple, couple of quick, quick notes. So I think everyone's found the hashtag is tech chill, hashtag chill. 
Um, there is a Buzztail story. Um, if you want to join it, you need to download the app, um, and you can join the story, and it will be retweeting stuff that you're doing as well. Um, for lunch, uh, we have sold from yesterday uh, noon, we've been selling late bird tickets. Late bird tickets were, didn't have lunch included because you booked too late. So if you're a holder of a late bird ticket, please do not go and stand in the lunch queue in, in the place of someone who paid for lunch. There should be enough food left, but please wait for everyone as a full price early bird ticket to eat lunch. I'd appreciate your help with this. Thank you. Have a good time.